The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of our virtual mentoring webinar series. Um, today, we're going to talk about how to implement a successful virtual mentoring program and really what that looks like and some tips and best practices for success. Uh, my name is Katie Mouton, and I will be your host for this webinar. Before we get started, I do want to be very transparent that, like many of you, we are working from home today. So some of us may have a wild two-year-old running around in the background, and by some of us, I mean me. Uh, so please ignore any noises that you may hear. Um, before we get started, I do want to go over some housekeeping items. So we are recording the webinar, and I will be sending that out to everyone via email later today. So be on the lookout for that link. I'm also going to go ahead and include the link from part one in case you didn't get that ahead of time. Um, also, everyone has been muted for the webinar. Uh, we will not be unmuting people, but we do encourage you to participate through the chat box. So if you have any questions, I'll be answering those um, throughout the webinar, and then we'll save some time at the end for questions as well. So we're going to try and get to everyone's questions today. So as you have those pop into your head, just put them in the chat box and we'll go from there. All right, and as you can see, Judy just shared her screen. We're going to meet our speakers. This is something we did in the last webinar. We thought it was a little fun, so we're all going to share our webcams. All right, there we go. Hey, everybody. All right, so as I said, my name is Katie Mouton. I am the digital marketing specialist at Insala. I've been with Insala for about three years. Speaking of my two-year-old, sorry. <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited to be here and continue this conversation on virtual mentoring. I am now going to pass it over to Judy. Thanks, Katie. You know, I think nowadays one of the, the housekeeping tips needs to be that, you know, there could be puppies in the background or kids in the back, whatever it might be. So that almost gets to be a housekeeping tip and doing that. But I'd like to personally welcome everybody. I'm Judy Corner. I am the Director of Mentoring and Consulting with Insala, and I have been in the mentoring space for right at about 30 years. This is a passion of mine. It's something I greatly believe in, and I'd like to welcome everybody back that was here before, and welcome everybody if you're here for the first time. Matthew, turning it over to you, and I'm going to give you the whole stage. Wow, thank you, Judy. I feel so important. Well, hello everyone. My name is Matthew Heilman. I am the manager of training here at Insala. Um, I see quite a few names that I recognize. So hello to the people I'm familiar with and welcome to everyone else joining. I've been with Insala about five years and I've been in the L&D space for about 15 years. So um, I'm excited to be working with Judy on this. She primarily focuses on mentoring program administration and I focus more on the technology side. So that's why these webinars have been a great mix for us to collaborate and work together. And I'm really excited to have this webinar today. So welcome everyone. Okay. Bye-bye, Matthew. But Katie, will you tell us a little bit more about Insala? Sure. So for those of you who aren't familiar, we all work at Insala, as we said, and we are a um, talent development software and solutions company. So what we do is we offer both software and consulting services to our clients to help them really engage, develop, transition, and connect their employees. As you can see on the screen, this is a screenshot of our beautiful new website. And I'm not just saying that because I helped make it, um, but we do have our services listed at the bottom. We focus on career management, mentoring, coaching, career transition, and alumni. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us on our website, which you've all been to already to register. So it's www.insala.com. Okay, thanks, Katie. You know, I just happened to come across this particular um, quote that talks about, you know, we've been talking about, you know, virtual mentoring last time. We, we really got into you know, virtual mentoring. It was interesting because I actually had a couple of people make a comment to me that during this virtual time that, that we've been going through, they said, you know, we've been hearing a lot about Zoom meetings and a lot about things, but I didn't think about mentoring, you know, as a part of that. And so I'm glad we did the one. So the last time, again, we, t we talked about mentoring and now we're going to talk about, you know, how you make that transition. But I thought this was a really good quote that came out and she, you know, whilst the plethora of live streams, panel discussions and webinars are available, it's essential 
don't overlook the real life support of a mentor. And again, we believe that is so important. So to get started, let's talk about those kind of things we're going to do today. First of all, we're going to talk about how do I prepare for success? You know, some of this is a little bit of the 80-20 rule. You know, make sure 80% plan, 20% implement. So how do I do that? And then we're going to talk about why and how you need to train your mentors and mentees. Don't just let people take on these roles without providing them with some training. One of the things that I talk about many times is you wouldn't put anybody in a role that, number one, they weren't qualified for, number two, they didn't have the skills to implement that role, and number three, you didn't provide them with some training. So again, we're going to talk about this training for mentors and mentees. And then we're going to talk about program administration with technology. And you know, as we go through this, we're going to talk about how important we believe the technology is, because otherwise your program can become an administration nightmare. So we're going to talk about that. And then last, we're going to talk about reinforcement. It's kind of the one area we find that organizations really get excited and they roll out the program and they do all these great things and they forget, and then they let it drop and they forget to keep it going and keep it reinforcing. But as we begin, Katie, will you take us through our first poll? Absolutely. So something that we like to do is get to know a little more about you. So we're going to run this poll really quick. And we want to know, do you currently have a mentoring program in place? So the options are, yes, we've had a mentoring program for a few years. Yes, we have recently started a program. Oh, the third one, I am so sorry. That is my mistake. The third one should be uh, no, but we are working on creating one. <laughs> and then the last one would be no, we do not. So that third one is no, we don't have a program, but we're working on getting one started. All right, it looks like we have quite a few people who have submitted their answer. We're just gonna give you all a few more seconds. All right, we've heard from pretty much everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and we can share the results. Okay, so it looks like 45% of you have had a program for a few years, 22% have recently started one, 8% have not started there yet, there's yet, but they're working on it, and then 25 of you actually don't have a mentoring program at all. So I think this is a really nice balance of all the people that we have here today. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that in, in, in what you're doing. So super glad to hear that. So those of you that have got one going, we hope we also can give you some tips. And for those that, you know, you're looking at starting one, hopefully we can start you on the right track in, in being able to do that. And for those of you that don't have one, we sincerely hope that you can get excited about the concept and, and get started on one. So again, virtual mentoring. This is something, as I said, we started talking about last week, that it really is a problem. It's an issue. And, and I repeat myself, but as I said, uh, talked with some people last week after the, the webinar and they made the comment, you know, that they, they just hadn't thought about mentoring as a solution. They were, had been concentrating so much on things like Zoom and, you know, office types of things and, and some of those, they hadn't thought about the tool to help people develop uh, from mentoring and doing that. So we're gonna take it through some steps in doing that and the very first step is prepare for success. One of the things that we have learned, and like I said, I've been doing this for well over 30 years, is there is a direct correlation between planning and success. Low planning is going to give you low success. High planning is going to give you high success. And again, it's, it's pretty much all those things that we talk about, which is, you know, hey, guess what? It's the 80-20 rule. If you don't do a good plan before you implement, you know you're going to run into problems. So we really have a readiness process that we suggest individuals go through. And here's the kind of things that, that it covers in doing that. One is make sure that you have identified your organizational objectives and measurements. First of all, you can't do your measurements until you get your objectives in place. But I can tell you people need to understand why you're doing this and we believe you should know your results. A lot of times people say, you know, we're not really going to, you know, go through and measure this. But, you know, we believe you should in, in doing that. And then make sure you have thought about 
all of the elements that are necessary to have a success, including an implementation. You know, have a rollout plan of this is what I need to do first, this is what I need to do second, so on and so forth in, in what I'm doing. And then, and this is, we find one of those areas that, that again, people kind of don't think about. You need to go through and think about all of the key advantages to the mentor, the mentee, and the organization overall. Because quite honestly, those can be your sales points. That's, that's your marketing and what you're doing. But also what you need to think about is what are all the possible challenges that might come up for a mentor, a mentee, and new organization. And the reason that becomes important is you want to make sure you've thought about the solutions to some of those possible challenges before they come up. You don't want them to come up in the middle of your program implementation and then find out, uh-oh, we didn't think about that one as, as we're going forward. Next, you need to think about all those critical process elements and the tools. And, and we talk about a lot of things like, we're going to go through and talk about the fact that, you know, you need to let people know exactly what their roles are. They need to understand that. Don't take a lot of things for granted. You know, have you thought about, based on those organizational objectives and measurements, what are some of the possible types of things that, that could happen if we don't do this and we don't tie it to specific skills, knowledge areas, competencies that we want people to really improve in? And then make sure that you really understand people's past experiences and perception. One of the things that we talk about when we talk about mentoring is, you know, the good news about mentoring is it's thousands of years old. The bad news about mentoring is it's thousands of years old. And the reason we say that is there are a lot of historical perceptions and sometimes misperceptions around mentoring. So before you roll out your program, you want to make sure you've got everybody on the same page as to what it means to be a mentor, what it means to be a mentee, and what it needs to be mentoring overall and doing that. So you need to think about some of those things. And then, again, we suggest you have some technology tools to do this. Depending on the size of your program could depend on the type of technology you've got. But again, it keeps your program from being an administration nightmare. So, Matthew, what I'd like to do is have some of your input on this. I mean, after, after we do readiness or don't do readiness, then Matthew sometimes can get stuck with the problem. So, Matthew? Sure. No, I could talk on this slide forever, but then Katie would kill me. So, no, definitely, I think this is the most crucial thing. And me being the technology side of the portal and Judy being, you know, just the actual mentoring program itself, um, we have so much that we work on together. And the number one thing, though, is just what's on this slide. It's technology can be a wonderful tool to use, but your program has to be in place. And I know this kind of looks like a lot, but a lot of this just boils down to what are you trying to accomplish? What's important? What do you need to provide back to your stakeholders for your ROI? And what's important to this program? I mean, so it's, there's such big ideas. And of course, those questions can all be discussed ad infinitum. I'm trying to use a word that I forgot, but I'm trying to remember. Anyways, yes, I would definitely say that technology is a great thing that can help you support that program. But until those first five things are in place, technology can almost be a burden because you may not be ready for it. And then adding technology into the mix, especially with your familiarity level of technology can be a struggle. And just so we know too, when we're talking technology, obviously in Sala we have our portal, but we're also just saying things like an Excel spreadsheet or using SharePoint. So technology can be whatever level it needs to be. But at the end of the day, technology is a wonderful thing to add to your program to make it better, but it's not your program. Thanks, Matthew. And, and that really is so important. You know, I kind of go back to, uh, uh, every time I think about this, to an old saying that used to be when it had, had to do with technology, and it was called GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. And so if you haven't gone through and thought about your program and all the things you really want to accomplish, then that's what's going to happen when you take it to technology. So you want to ensure you've really got good success in all the elements of what you're going to do with your program ahead of time. So at this point in time, we also want to talk about the next step in your process, and that is you need to train 
your mentors and mentees. So just like we talked about the fact that there is a high correlation between training and, or planning and success, we have found there is a high correlation between training and success. Low training, low success, high training, high success in, in what people are doing. So to give you an idea on some of these things, you know, why do mentors and mentees need training? Well, one of the very first things that we're going to talk about is they need to understand what the organizational objectives are. I can guarantee you, if you roll out the, a program, first thing they're going to ask you about is, well, okay, why are we doing this? Why are we taking our time? Why are we spending our dollars and so on in, in being able to do that? So make sure that they really understand why they're doing this and in being involved in this. They also need to understand their role. And again, going back to what I made a comment on about the different perceptions of what it takes to be a mentor and a mentee. One of the things that we have, and we suggest highly that you do this, is we've actually got a job description, a role profile of what it takes to be a good mentor and what it takes to be a good mentee. So don't assume that everybody knows how to be a mentor and how to be a mentee. So make sure they've got something, some guidelines to go by and some specific guidelines to go by in, in what they're doing. And then give them some best practices because once they get into that partnership, you can do great things about setting your program up and doing some things, but then you gotta turn it over to the mentors and mentees. So make sure you give both mentors and mentees really good best practices for interacting and connecting and what they're gonna be doing. Let them see examples. Let them hear examples of what success looked like. And when you give them some of those best practices, let them understand why those best practices will lead to success in what you're doing. And then make sure they've got the chance to be aware of some possible challenges, as well as giving them the opportunity to, you know, really be able to communicate their own thoughts about what might be a possible challenges in doing that. So what does training look like? Well, you know, you could do it with webinars, you could do it with workshops, uh, you could combine them and do those kind of things you wanna do. I can tell you right now, with virtual mentoring, it's definitely webinars. Uh, in fact, that's, that's a lot of what we are doing right now, is training mentors and mentees via webinar. And it's a great way to do that. So this is what training could look like when you implement it, but I can tell you that this is what training, what can happen with if you don't do training. You know, again, make sure that you've got some kind of a way for people to ask questions. You know, don't just assume if you give them a handout that they're going to absolutely understand everything. Because again, there are a lot of different perceptions around mentoring and people have got questions and they may not ask them if you don't. So we had a situation in one organization and, and they started out in the program and then it wasn't going so well and they couldn't quite figure out why. Well, they had an information program kind of rolled out. This is why the organization is doing this, so on and so forth, and doing that. And then they handed everybody a booklet. Well, guess what didn't get read? I mean, we all know you hand somebody a booklet like that, and it ends on your desk, and it's laying there, and then the next thing you know, there's 15 things on top of that booklet, and it just may never get read in what you're doing. Not only that, but what we began to find out when we went back and actually did, and this was based on an organization that is global in scope. So we were doing this with people throughout the world. And so that, it wasn't, uh, it was definitely virtual uh, training that we were doing in that. And one of the things we began to find out was they had questions. Now they'd ask questions about the organization process when they had this information program, but they weren't asking questions about actually mentoring or being a mentor. And so what kept coming up as we were doing some of this, they're asking questions about how do I be a mentor or a lot of what I call the what if questions. And those are around, well, what if this happens? Or what if that happens? And how do I handle this and so on? So, you know, 
they they wanted to understand about the partnerships and how they interact in the partnerships and, and what they do there. So this can be a real problem if you skip the training and what you're going to be doing, however you put that together. Don't just let people out there and, and let them flounder. So here's some tips, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but you need to go through to successfully train your virtual mentors and mentees. And I'm, you know, going to talk about one specifically uh, in doing that. And a lot of that had to do with making sure that your participants have a way to ask questions, get clarity, and all the things that they do. That's the one to me that it's incredibly important to do that. Again, don't just hand out that booklet. Don't just give them a PowerPoint presentation and assume everything's okay or, you know, make, you know, a video or something. They've got to have a way to ask any questions that are important to them to obtain clarity. And, you know, Matthew, I'm going to ask you, what do you think out of looking at this list? What, are, what stands out as the most important one for you? Uh, it's, it's such a good list. I'm trying to pick just one, but I would say that there's a couple that kind of tie together and it's primarily, it all falls off of the continued training throughout the program. Make sure that you're training everyone that needs to be trained. You're not just training the mentors and mentees, but you're training your managers and your supervisors. You're hopping on the Zoom calls or you're hopping on Go Google Meet. There's a million different ways to communicate now. Um, but it's making sure that everyone's getting trained and you're evaluating the training as you're going. So if you start to see some of your participants struggling because they're not sure what to do, bring in training. If you're starting to see some of the managers or supervisors are not promoting and supporting the program, bring in the training. So a lot of people like to associate that training is what you do for the participants at the very beginning and then you're done. But it's really something that goes on the entire time. And sometimes it's hard to develop that plan, but if you just kind of keep in that learning mindset, especially for those of you that are beginning your program, every month take a moment to say, what training do people need? And eventually you're gonna to get to the point that either they don't need any, or you've already developed the materials you need and you can just implement that. So you're not having to constantly create, but yeah, just keeping the training going and realizing that as new people join and people, or as time goes by, people may forget, training just needs to constantly be happening. It's not a one and done. Great. And, and I, I appreciate that in, in doing that, especially that, that piece about the continual training. And we're going to talk about some things about evaluation and, and continuing and that um, reinforcing piece of what we're doing. But, you know, one of the things that, that does become important is, is that training managers and supervisors and doing that. In fact, when we go through our readiness program, one of the things we talk about when we talk about, you know, how are you going to market your program? How, how, how are you going to communicate? And we talk about different ways to do that. Of course, everybody thinks about emails. You know, well, we're going to promote this through emails. But that's like one of many ways you can do that. But one of the ways that they forget about is the fact that, you know, your managers can be one of your best marketing pieces if they totally buy into the program and if they understand what it's all about. Because a lot of times individuals will come up to their managers and they'll say, you know, I've heard about this mentoring program. Do, do, do you really think that that would be something that would be good for me? And you want your managers to be the ones that are promoting also. So, again, don't forget your managers as you're going through this and, and taking this forward. So what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about this program administration uh, with technology. And there's something we'd like you guys to do with us. So, what challenges are you faced with in managing your mentoring program? And Katie, I understand we want everybody to jump in the chat box. That is correct. So if you will share your comments with us in the chat box, we're going to read off a few of those. Um, Judy, while we're waiting on people to participate, could you maybe tell us a few of the, the challenges that you've seen from our clients when they're, you know, managing their mentoring program? Yeah, and, and some of them we've already talked about. First of all, it's, it's that readiness piece. And, and we find that what's happening is that individuals are jumping into the program. They're just saying, you know, oh, we can do this. I, I don't know how many times that I have heard 
individuals have gotten, you know, the, the word from their, you know, managers or upper da um, upper um, management and doing that and saying, hey, this can't be all that complicated. Let's just roll it out and doing that. And so they do. They, they roll everything out and doing that. And then what begins to happen is um, looking at that and saying, we didn't think it's through. And it ended up being kind of a flop. So I would say the biggest challenge is, is one of the biggest challenges is, is people going through and actually not planning. And then in the middle of it, realizing this didn't work. And again, don't know how many times we've talked to uh, clients and they'll say, we used to have a program, but it really didn't work. And then when you ask why, we start finding out some of these things. And then, Matthew, I'd ask you, what, are, what would you say is one of the biggest things? Actually, um, before we jump to Matthew, we are getting some people commenting, and I did want to read some of oh, these. Oh, good. Um, so we have someone saying that people dropped out of the program and they were unaware until they followed up to see how it was going. Um, another challenge is they're not sure where to start with planning. Um, there's been challenges of getting buy-in, which we've seen that a lot. Um, also, the size of the population we're trying to reach, lack of funding, time to create the toolkits and training, uh, which is a really good place where readiness can come in to help. Um, finding mentors and follow through. Um, we don't have issues getting people to sign up for the program, but getting them to participate. So matching to their mentor, starting a mentoring relationship, those types of things. Um, how to adapt to the company and participation from new hires. So I feel like these are very well-rounded challenges and it's something that we've seen with a lot of our clients. Um, and I know Judy, this is a lot of this is what you address in your mentoring readiness program. Um, so may, another one just came in, maintaining mentoring relationship between mentors and mentees. Yeah, I mean, these are these are all very, very common that we've seen throughout the years in working with clients. Um, so yeah, I think that those are exactly what we were expecting to see. Absolutely, and, and again, what I'm hearing, or exactly as you were saying, Katie, these are things that you need to think about ahead of time. And make sure you've got a solution to before you roll out your program. It's that readiness piece. And then the other thing I was hearing was what we just talked about, which was training in, in doing that. So, again, the two things that we've talked about so far are, are things that would solve or certainly be good solutions to that. Um, I would like to, to look at the one about that somebody said, you know, people dropping out or can't find enough mentors in, in doing that. One of the historical misperceptions around mentoring is that if I'm going to be a mentor, it's kind of like, oh, geez, this is a lifetime commitment, and, and, and it's going to take hours and hours, you know, a month for me to do this. And I just haven't got the time. But if you've got that role profile for your mentors, and, and they're, they're trained, and, and they understand what to do, we suggest that, you know, first of all, if you can't meet at least two hours a month, between the mentor and mentee, chances are you're not going to get much out of the program. But if you're talking to someone and saying, you know, and being able to hand them a role profile so that they understand exactly what's expected of them, and you're saying, you know, we only need you like, you know, around two hours a month, suddenly that doesn't become quite so daunting. And you're saying, you know, the, the program is, is going to be anywhere. It could be, you know, 9, 10, 12 months, however it's going to be. And we only need you for that period of time. This doesn't sound quite so daunting in doing that. So, like I said, that's one of those that we find. Matthew, can you think of any others? Yeah, I think we're about to address some of them, especially when we're discussing the technology. But, yeah, what I'm pretty much hearing is the biggest issues are the readiness part and the engagement part. And, you know, you were just discussing readiness, and I'll here shortly be discussing the engagement. There you go. Okay. All right, so moving on, these are some of the types of administration responsibilities that when you are actually going through and you are going to implement your program, these are some of the things. And I'm going to look at this first one, and I'm not going to spend time on all of these, but you have got to qualify your mentors and mentees in doing this. You can't just let anybody be a mentor or mentee, and a lot of times organizations do that. And usually what ends up is the partnerships fall apart. As somebody had mentioned before, people drop out because they don't know what it's, you know, they've got, you know, ahead of them. So, again, those row profiles. And 
part of what we talk about and go into here is the success of your mentoring initiative is highly dependent on the quality of your mentors. And also that your mentees are not going into this just to get promoted, but they're going into it for development and these types of things and moving in. And these become very, very important. And one of the things you're going to find is all of these things are important. Matthew, I'm going to be turning this over to you because you do the technology training um, with, within Insala, and you're the best one to, to handle these next pieces. But do you see anything in here that you'd say, oh, we've got to talk about this? From this list, I would I'd definitely say probably number four is one of the most crucial ones, the supervising, because that's where it's a struggle. Getting the program set up is one thing. Getting people matched is one thing. But again, that engagement piece that now people, you have maybe 100 different relationships. How do you supervise that? How are you communicating with them? And I think that's where a lot of the pieces kind of fall apart is you get them started and then it's that follow-up. And that's always a training, L&D, mentoring kind of situation. It's that follow-up that's the biggest struggle. Hey, okay, I'm gonna turn the technology over to you, Matthew. Sure. So again, I'm that technology person. So. What we've been talking about again is how technology can support you. And again, technology can literally be using an Excel sheet or using a whole implementation portal. I don't know why I keep saying implementation. It's my favorite word right now. I don't know. But yes, technology is meant to support your program. And it doesn't matter really how you're using it. But when it comes to virtual mentoring, technology is crucial. It's not even an option because it's virtual. You know, it's, that's it's built into what it is. So what I want to talk to you all about is some of the processes that we've seen make a virtual mentoring program successful. So just looking at this list, we have things like the program manager, which of course there's always going to be a program manager for a mentoring program, virtual mentoring program, no matter what. It's the person that's running that program. So technology can support that program manager because I know one thing in particular with a lot of clients I work with the primary discussion that comes up is, what do you do for your organization? And very rarely do I hear a person that says, I am full-time a mentoring program administrator. Usually I hear, I run our mentoring program, but actually I work over here. So already I understand and we all understand that mentoring, it's always a good focus for an organization, but it's not always given the resources it needs. And that's where technology can come in to support running that program, keeping things organized so the program manager can focus on the program and not so much about, did this go out here? Did these two people get matched? So technology can definitely help your program manager. Uh, a mentoring dashboard. One of the things that we see with our clients struggling with too sometimes is you may be super invested in your program, but the stakeholders involved, they need a snapshot. What is going on in your program? They don't really want you to run down the gamut and saying, this is how many relationships there are, this is when they happened, um, this is what they look like, this is how they're working. They wanna know, just give me a visual. I need a slide or two of quick information. So again, that's where technology can come in, is that you can get those PowerPoint slides or Excel sheets set up or a portal to literally just have everything demonstrate to you what's going on in, the, um, in your program. So a quick cheat sheet for those stakeholders. Um, mentoring matching, that's a huge thing. And it's so funny, I've been with themselves for so long, whenever people say mentor matching, I think that's not hard because I'm thinking of our, our system. It's not hard with our system, but it can be so much. We've had clients come to us that they have over a thousand people in the program and they're using an Excel spreadsheet to match them, which, you know, if you have 50 people in a program, an Excel spreadsheet, that's smart. You have your list of mentors, list of mentees, connect the dots, you're done. But once you get past about 50 people, it can turn into a nightmare. And then it's not just, well, I'm matching this person with this person because I, I, I don't know, I know them both and they think, I think they'll work well. It's making sure that you're doing it according to your objectives. Are you trying to do a career development program, a leadership program? What's important to that mentee and what's important to that mentor? So again, with virtual mentoring, it's also taking it to the next level that not only are they doing it online, but you have to really gather what they're interested in because traditional mentoring programs in the past, you know, it was 
pretty standard on what everybody was looking for. But now that we're in the new environment of virtual mentoring, it's things have changed. People may be interested in, you know, I have a two-year-old at home. What are some best practices from other parents that can support me with figuring out what best to do? And that's definitely something I cannot help in because I have a two-year-old dog, but not a baby, quite different there. And I understand that. So again, the mentoring matching technology can support get that done quickly and easily. Automated messaging system, that's where that engagement. When I was talking earlier about, you know, the readiness, which Judy was illustrating beautifully, the messaging is the hardest part for engagement because you get everyone started, but then what? Well, you want to send out a communication after they've been in a relationship for a month to say, hey, you've been in a relationship for a month. Here's what we recommend you doing. Um, you know, it's been two months, it's been three months. And the reason why using technology to support that for virtual mentoring is because we have a lot of clients that say, well, we don't have a, a what I call just a, a cyclical mentoring program. Like we start in January, we end in February. We have some clients that definitely do that, but we have a lot of clients that say, well, the program starts and stops whenever they want. Like we may do like a big support thing in March to get people excited about it again, but people can join March, April, May, June. So trying to manage, okay, well, all these people are one month in, but these people are two months in, these people are three months in, that can, that can turn into a nightmare because you don't know what communications to send out. So what you end up doing is making a blanket email that for some people might be helpful and for the majority it's not. So for a virtual mentoring, it's really important to push those email communications, push those Zoom calls and remind people how to stay engaged because it's very hard when you're not seeing people face to face. Participant learning plan, that's a wonderful place where the mentees can track their goals. And part of the training is having those mentees and mentors understand their responsibilities. Because when it comes to mentoring, mentees are in charge of their learning and the mentor supports them. So it's important to make sure that that's able to be tracked online. When people are meeting face to face, you can have a piece of paper, jot it down, keep it at your desk. But when it's virtual mentoring, you don't have that luxury. You need to find a way to communicate with each other in a virtual environment. And things like the Insala portal support that because there's an actual learning plan you could put in your goals, actions towards those goals, due dates. So again, it's a way to track it online. And finally, it's that reporting system. And again, this kind of goes all the way back to the program manager. It's making sure that you're able to track it. So again, when you're having a, a physical mentoring program where you're meeting face to face, it's a little easier to have a sign-in sheet and here's what's going on and here's who attended. But online, everyone's kind of doing their own thing. You're supporting them, but they don't always have a way to connect with each other. And there's not always a way for you to report on it. So having technology in place to say, well, this is how often people are logging into the mentoring program. This is how they're connecting. This is what they're doing. That ties in with that mentoring dashboard and program admin. It's a way for you to report back on the ROI of your program. Um, so yeah, all of these, they're crucial no matter what kind of mentoring program you have, but they're so important when it comes to virtual mentoring because it's all now going into online. It's all going into technology. Matthew, Thanks, Matthew. Go ahead, Katie. Sorry. We did have a question that popped up while you were talking, and I think it's really relevant for right now, so I want to go ahead and throw it to you. Um, can you track individual development plan progress in the mentoring system? You definitely can. So that's where the, that learning plan comes into place. There's several ways to do it, but the easiest one is the learning plan. And that's where the mentee or the mentor can put in goals and they can say, you know, my goal is to complete a certification program. Well, one of the actions for that goal is to sign up. Another is to get manager approval. So, I mean, breaking down just the big idea of a goal into action step items, and that can be very easily tracked within the system. Um, our system also has integration with things like Skillsoft. So if you already have an LMS set up, it can be integrated with our system so that when people complete items and lessons and curriculum in Skillsoft, it'll automatically update in the mentoring program. Okay, is that do it, Katie? Yep, that, I think that answered the question. Thanks. No, that was a great timing on that one. Okay. Um, one of the things I'd like to, to give an example in the reporting system, and I'm, I am telling you, and Sal has been talking about what we at that point in time called distance mentoring for over 20 years. I mean, this is not something that's new, and it just has a different name to it now called virtual mentoring. 
But I remember many years ago that one of the things, and this happened to be a banking situation, and there were, you know, throughout the United States, and this guy was, first of all, managed, he was matching 300 different pairs, and, and I, you know, in doing that, and then, you know, he talked about previously reporting, all he had to do, it wasn't a big deal, but he had to put together 10 spreadsheets to be able to do that, and, you know, you get to a point, I didn't know whether to send him a sympathy basket or, or what, but I couldn't imagine trying to do um, that type of administration of the system, you know, under those circumstances, so to speak, in doing that. But again, technology, whatever Florida takes, is really important in being able to do that. The one of the last things we want to talk about, and I kind of talked about this before, and I said, you know, programs get kicked off, everybody gets excited, you may even, you know, uh, train them, you may get people going, and then it gets to be dropped. And so what we talk about is you've got to have reinforcement. You need to keep your program continually going and you need to keep people continually engaged in what you're doing and taking it forward. One of the ways that you need to do that is you need to evaluate your, your virtual mentoring program. As Matthew was saying, you know, if you're meeting face-to-face -face and everybody's in the same office and all this is happening, that, you know, that can be a little easier. But with a virtual mentoring program, you know, you've got to be pretty careful. Now, we talk about the fact that you really should evaluate your program, first of all, in, I would say, six to eight weeks after a partnership starts. And, and your technology message, messaging will help you to do this. But the reason you need to do it that quickly is if there's any problems in the partnerships, you want to find out about them ASAP and get people back on the track. Because many times what will happen is people will have a problem and they won't get it solved and they just keep on going and the problem begins to get worse and worse. And so, you know, there's a whole series of questions. You know, you want to find out from the mentor, you know, and the mentee, are you having regular scheduled meetings, you know, or, or things getting off track, you know, and, and doing that. You know, ask the mentor, is there anything you wish your mentee might be doing differently? Or ask the mentee, anything you, you wish your mentor was doing different? You know, are there any issues that need to be addressed? Is there anything else we can do from an organization standpoint to improve these partnerships? And then, you know, don't forget the managers. Make sure to ask them. Because, again, they need to be supporting these mentoring partnerships and what they do. And, you know, have, have you talk to your mentor or the individual who reports to you, if you're a mentor or mentee, what do they feel like about the program and doing that? And, you know, what comments have they've got? And then, you know, as, you, as you're going forward and they're into the partnership, begin to ask them things like, for the mentors and the mentees, what are you getting out of the, this? You know, what are you personally as a mentor getting out of this? And as a mentee, not just the development, but what are you getting out of it? And, you know, what kind of development are you very specifically seeing happen? Now, I've got this at six to eight weeks, and that one stays. That, that one's there in, in doing that because, again, we believe you should do an evaluation as quickly as possible in the beginning to find out if there's any issues in doing that. Now, whether it's at five to six months, nine months, or, or whatever, that's going to kind of depend on how long your mentoring program is and, and how long the mentoring partnerships normally run. Now, if you've got a program that runs somewhere around 10 months, that's probably pretty good. You, you might want to say, okay, we'll do this at four to five, instead of five to six, and then whatever. If you've got one that runs a year, this is pretty true. I will tell you that however you do this, at about two-thirds of the time through the mentoring partnership, the mentoring program that you've got going, things begin to slow down. And you need to work on re-engaging your people in, in exactly what you're doing. So, you know, it may not be exactly five to six months or four to seven months or whatever, but just about that two-thirds mark, you need, need to do that in keeping them. And again, you know, we talked about all the different ways to uh, be able to do that with your technology. Some other ways you can do that is, is keep having some ongoing webinars you know, little things, or, you know, it might be, you know, ongoing training, and, you know, so quick reinforcement sessions, and through your evaluation, they're going to find out maybe where that is. 
you can have a situation where, you know, the mentor went through training and now that he's in the middle of the partnership, maybe, you know, a ongoing, you know, webinar or training around how to handle difficult conversations, you know, is, is important. If it's the mentee, you know, maybe the mentee's having some problems. They're not getting the feedback from their mentor like they need it. And they need some help on doing that. But these are things that kind of come up after they've started the partnership. So again, you know, make sure you do some things. One of the other things we suggest are newsletters. And we do these with clients, and the, the one comment that is pretty consistent when we do this is the fact that they say, the mentors or mentees, however it is they're sending it out to, say, it keeps mentoring top of mind. Now, we've got some clients where we send these out every other month, some that where it's every um, twice a month, whatever it might be, and that's going to have to be up to you and how you put your newsletters together. But this is, you know, um, what you, you want to be able to kind of keep everybody engaged, keep them up to date. And there is nothing that's any better than success examples. We have found that, you know, be able to say, did you know? that, you know, Matthew has told us that the best example he had and how this happened to him, how important it was and what he got out. Um, I remember one organization we worked with and the mentee wrote in and said, talk about success. I worked with my mentor. They really helped me with a special presentation I was doing to a um, very high profile client. And based on that, I just won a $410,000 sale. And they said, I couldn't have done it without the help of my mentor in, in doing that. So great success and all the way around. So these are the kind of things you, that you really want to look at. Oops, sorry about that. So here's some best practices for implementing a virtual mentoring program. And, you know, one of the things that's important to keep in mind is all the things that we've talked about today are pretty much, you know, things that you would do no matter what your program is. But they are especially especially important for a virtual mentoring, you know, program that you go through. And, and, you know, just, you know, make sure, do not force anybody to be a mentor. You know, we, we know those things just don't work. Make sure you've got a marketing plan. And we also can suggest you have a pool of qualified mentors and mentees so that if people are doing self-matching, they can, can do that. And as Matthew was saying, you know, before, Make sure you've got your criteria for your matching and pairing and doing that. You don't just, you know, kind of throw people together um, in doing that. Track your progress. Be sure you've got metrics. And again, Matthew brought up this on messages. Communicate, communicate, communicate. And we just talk about the importance of evaluating and adjusting. So kind of as a recap, we talked about mentoring readiness, incredibly important. Make sure you got a plan, good solid plan, and you're ready to execute. And you don't just jump in the middle of the pool and then try and figure out whether you can swim or not and be able to do that. We also talked about training and the importance of training and letting people know what their roles are and helping them implement those roles. And then Matthew taught, walked us through the technology and the importance of that technology to keep your program from becoming an administration nightmare. And then, excuse me, we talked about reinforcing. Don't just do the readiness and do the training and have everything and a great program and everybody is excited and then drop. Make sure you've got all these reinforcement pieces that, that you would like to, to follow through. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take some questions that are there and as Katie mentioned in the very beginning, we are gonna to try to get to all the questions that are there, but if you've got one that you, we didn't have time to uh, ask or you thought of after uh, the webinar, here are our um, email addresses that you are more than welcome to um, contact us at any time. So Katie, we got some questions. Yeah, so someone just asked if you could go back to the slide on best practices for implementing a virtual mentoring program. I think they just want to take another look at it. I do want to let everyone know, I will be sending the recording out later, but I'm also going to attach some PDFs to it. So the PDFs are going to include the tips for training that we talked about in a list for you, and also these best practices. So we are going to give you a hard, hard copy of those. I'm also going to attach 
the PowerPoint because I know we shared a lot of information in very little time and you probably want to take another look at it. So we are going to include all of that whenever I send you over the recording of the webinar. Um, okay, while you take another look at this slide and we wait for some more questions to come in, I also want to let everyone know that we are going to be creating a virtual mentoring ebook. That's going to be coming out in the next month or so. So be on the lookout in your emails for that. Um, we're really excited about that project. We're going to have even more information put into the ebook than we had in the webinar. A lot of great stats and facts and lists for you. So that's coming as well. All right, we do have another question. Do you have suggestions for addressing a mentor or mentee who is not meeting expectations in the relationship? Um, I would say usually when I've seen that happen, it's because they didn't understand what the roles were uh, in, in, in doing that. Um, the perfect example, worked with an organization, we actually, they actually went through the readiness program and they said, oh, we're, we're ready. And then I actually went and was conducting the uh, training for the mentors. And I could tell pretty, pretty quickly after we hadn't been in the training very long, there was a lot of, you know, head shaking and there was, you know, some blazed eyes and so on. I said, okay, let's stop. I know what's going on. And what I heard was several people had the impression that they, all they had to do was this was kind of like, oh, I thought we just would take this person to lunch every once in a while and see how they're doing. And, you know, that might be in a nice relationship, but it's not mentoring. So I would say that a lot of times what we find is that people are missing expectations because of one or two reasons. Number one, they didn't know what was expected of them to be a mentor or a mentee. Um, one of the things Matthew said was the mentee drives this partnership. And sometimes without training, they don't know what that means. And then I would say the next reason for doing that is the fact they didn't have a plan together. And they didn't put one together. And so therefore, you know, it's kind of like, well, we'll get what accomplished. And there, there really is any goals to do that. And, you know, I think that that begins to make a very, very big difference. And then the third reason may be that during the first couple of be, um, meetings in the partnership, that there was some miscommunications between the two of them, and they didn't have anywhere to go to ask questions to find out, you know, any answers. So it goes back to that reinforcement and evaluation piece to find out if everybody's uh, on track. But Part of that, like I said, a big one is, are they qualified to be a mentor, a mentee? Is there a plan in place? If they're not executing the plan, why not? And being able to find that through evaluation. I hope that answered the, the question. Yeah, I think that that was, that was a very detailed answer. Um, we do have another question. Do you have tips on how to get, or I'm sorry, do you have tips on how to recruit more mentors into your program? They're saying that many times there's more mentees interested and not enough mentors. Judy, I know we see that a lot with our clients as well. Do you have any tips to help them recruit more mentors? Yeah, you're right. They have more mentees that, that are volunteering than the mentors. Part of that goes back to what I mentioned before. Again, that historical misperception from individuals thinking, you know, if I sign up to be a mentor, this is going to be a lifetime commitment and, you know, it's going to take all this time and I haven't got time and so on where if you've got that, you know, role profile put together, um, you know, so that they're very clear about here's what it takes to be a mentor uh, in doing this. This is the time that we're expecting you, you know. So if you're t telling somebody, you know, I'm asking, we're asking you, assuming they're qualified to be a mentor, uh, we're asking you for two hours a month for the next, you know, nine, ten months, Somehow that doesn't sound as daunting as, oh, this is going to go on for a lifetime. So we find the reason, the biggest reason that it is hard to recruit mentors is the fact that they don't understand. They, they're going from some kind of a previous. So, you know, and we also suggest that part of your readiness is that you have some kind of an information program so that before somebody signs up to be a mentor mentee, they understand what they're getting into. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, we do have another question. Matthew, I'm gonna shoot this one over to you. How do you encourage documentation in the tool? Many times they engage and then do not document. 
Right. That is a very common problem. And I would say, first off and foremost, it has to do with training. Um, making sure that it's not just you should track your, your goal progress, it's a requirement of the program. And that's where the mentor can really come in and the mentors can be trained to say, if you're not documenting what we're doing, I can't support you because I need to see what you're doing. So that's part of the training for the mentee to understand that it's a requirement. It's part of training for the mentor to understand it should be an expectation held up by the mentor. Um, and I would also kind of promote that it's the benefits of it. Because again, if you just tell people to do it, some people will do it, some still won't. So it's really explained to them the benefits of tracking their, their goal progress and what that looks like and how making that communication easier between um, themselves and their mentor is going to allow them to really move forward with the goals. I mean, it's that the old idea of if you write it down, you're mo much more likely to do it than if you just talk about it. And you have that date, because especially with a learning plan, you can set goal dates. So instead of a three month goal date and then three months, be reminded, oh, that goal is coming up. Have I worked towards it? Have, have my priorities changed? So yeah, it's partly training to make sure they know it's a requirement of the program, and it's partly understanding the benefits of doing it, because if they don't see the benefit, they're not going to do it. All right, thank you, Matthew. Um, Judy, can you go back to the question slide at the end, please? I just want to put our email addresses up one more time. All right, perfect. Okay, so we have reached time. Um, as Judy said, if you have any additional questions that you come up with later or that pop up whenever you're watching um, the webinar again, please feel free to email any of us. Also, if you'd like to connect with us on LinkedIn, we're all there and we'd love to network. Um, so yeah, I wanna thank everyone for participating in the webinar series um, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar. Thank you very much. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you all for joining. Thank you.